everyone. This is one exciting day as we live stream our fifth show of Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. I'm your host, Andy Asher. Today, we take a couple of surprising twists and turns. I managed to raise the ire of my friend and colleague, Live Squared show host Greta Blackburn, who has something important to say about exploring the global complexity of aging and longevity. And you have peed me off. P.I. asterisk asterisk E.D. I know I got a rank, and we'll find out why. We'll find out a little bit more about that. We also take a visit to the Mediterranean-style community with beautiful weather and mild ocean waters, Qualcomm Beach, British Columbia, Canada. Now, the community has the oldest average population in all of Canada with a median age of 66. What more can you ask for? Right. And it's just... And uh, nice people. In Mimi's kitchen today, let's see what's going on. I'm going to make a wonderful salad with farro. I tasted it and farro has that wonderful tasty crunch. Um, it's unlike any other grain that I've ever had. You know, you know I, I often ask my idea. guests to share their origin or their backstory. Sometimes it, it gets surprising, gets some surprising answers. Mine though, because my dad who was a big city doctor actually. When I went off to college, he and my mom, they moved to a small town about 500 miles away. There he had reinvented himself into a second career. He wanted to improve the lives of older adults. Sounded fascinating, I thought, and I discovered it had a name, gerontology. I had not known it at the time that it was considered the fastest growing domain in the healthcare industry. Now, years later, when I retired, I started my second career following my dad's footsteps, taking up his pledge for improving the lives of older adults. With my skills and experience in the media and digital technology, I published one of the very first digital platforms just for people over 55, bloomerboomer.com, with epic content for tens of thousands of people. Now this year we took another step with the weekly program called Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. And at the end of today's show, I will tell you three ways that you can support the show and keep it growing. Let's go over and see how Mimi is doing in the kitchen. I know it sure sounded good when I was in there earlier. Hello, hello. Today I'm gonna make a wonderful salad with farro, it's an ancient grain that is very well known in Italy and the Mediterranean. And actually here in America, we like it too and it's very well known. So what I did is I boiled the water and the farro, I soaked it earlier so it can cook faster. So I'm gonna just drop it in the boiling water let it boil for a little bit, then cover it and get the heat down so it can simmer slowly for 10 to 12 minutes. And then I'm going to come back and show you how I put together this wonderful, wonderful salad that has a lot of protein, fibers, a lot of minerals. Uh, farro has a lot of magnesium and zinc and it is just a fabulous, fabulous um, food to eat. And it's a complete, um, complete dish that has everything, protein, fibers, uh, fresh vegetables, uh, olive oil, lemon. It's fabulous. So later for the, um, for the assembly of the salad. I'll talk to you later. Well, sounds good, Mimi. We'll check back shortly. Steeped in quaint British heritage and famous for its local arts, crafts, and beautiful French gardens, today on our island's tour, we visit modern-day Qualcomm Beach, British Columbia. It offers visitors a gentle countryside and golden, seemingly endless sandy beaches. Its provincial parks are within 30 minutes from Qualcomm Beach, I hope you'll enjoy it. Qualicum Beach on the Strait of Georgia on the northeastern coast of Vancouver Island in the shadow of Mount Aerosmith. The community has been a popular tourist destination, being near Victoria and Vancouver, as well as a retirement community. It is served by the Island Highway, the main northwest-southeast highway on the island, and an airport and a nearby ferry to Losquetti Island. 
So a little background now. Qualicum Beach is on the Nanaimo Lowlands. That's a narrow plain which lies between the Georgia Basin to the northeast and the Beaufort Range, one of Vancouver Island's ranges to the southwest. All right. Now, landforms were significantly changed by the uh, most recent advance of the glacial ice age about 18 to 19,000 years ago. The community is dotted with rental cottages along the coast. It has the oldest average population in Canada. And what attracts tourists here? Well, take it from Windy Knoll with the Qualicum Beach Visitor's There's Office. There's just nice little shops and cafes and the beach. <laughs> Right? And great restaurants. And what more can you ask for? Right? And it's just... And uh, nice people. <laughs> Given that the population is dominated by the age group between 65 and 69, forecasters say health and social services will likely see significant increases in employment opportunities. It is expected that employment will almost double over the next 25 years. Meanwhile, tourism will continue to thrive. Next week, be sure to join us when we tour Cathedral Grove, located in Macmillan Park. It's one of the most accessible strands of giant Douglas fir trees on Vancouver Island. Join us on Tuesday. Now, earlier in the show, I told you about the stir that I caused with our Live Squared host, Greta Blackburn, when uh, we were talking about the topic of aging and longevity. Putting it into financial terms, though, forecasters have predicted the longevity industry is expected to become one of the leading industries in the near future and outnumber all other sectors in both size and in market capitalization. Now, large prestigious universities are making large investments into aging, including Harvard and Stanford and Yale and Georgetown University, where I got a chance to talk with the Aging Well Hub director, Jen DeServens. We talked about what it means to decide on retirement. Always beg the question of, well, how much is enough? And what is, what does retirement look like? When do we um, retire? So I started working on some of the research around that and trying to gauge what people think um, and how prepared they are. And then, um, and then, pivoted to you know working at Georgetown directing the aging well hub where you know I'm excited to be able to delve you know head on in some of these issues yeah and you're finding uh, no two cases are the same or no two people's lives are the same it's you know also my personal journey to see how others you know have are looking at this and handling it there are uh, a lot of stereotypes around aging um, that go on and back for centuries. Of there are so many stereotypes and they're usually around aging and it's usually all negative. And not only are people living longer, but they're living what I call their health. Healthy longevity is increasing, not just how many years they're living, but how many years they're living in good health and retirement. And because people are looking at longer lives in retirement or after full-time work, I hate the term retirement, but um, but you know they're looking at I'm, I'm not going to be on the golf course all the time, and I'm not just going to be baking cookies in the kitchen. So, That's a big change. Yeah, the the stereotypes stick. Life isn't that way. How can we change these kind of stereotypes? One though is, you know, looking at what people have real life models from, you know, people like Warren Buffett, you know, titan of industry, um, who, you know, is in his 90s. You have models, I think, was it last year, two years ago, um, Sports Illustrated swimsuit model had someone in the, you know, her late 50s. Um, for the first time, when you look at, you know, people in the movies, um, and especially women, because I think, you know, there's the Derek Ball stereotype about women, you can't be sexy, and you can't, um, you know, have any value over a certain age. But, you know, you've looked at people like, you know, Jane Fonda, Jamie Lee Curtis, and, you know, all very much um, Involved. So I think that film has really helped a lot in terms of looking at, at people as they age in a different light.
um, and also just research. You know, ARP did a great um, study on the value of, of adults over age 50 and found that they give eight trillion annually to the economy, continued work, volunteering, you know, giving, um, you know, they're the largest consumer group. So I think it is a combination of having having real life examples, media, um, research and educating people. Now, are there uh, areas where the stereotype is changing more slowly? Yeah, I would say the workforce. One of the things I would love to do is to see age um, be added to diversity, equity, and inclusion policies in addition to race and ethnicity, um, to have training, better training throughout the workforce. So it's not someone doing the same job the same way for 30 years, but new ways of looking at it. Um, looking at, you know, even phased retirement or a different way for someone to step down who may say, I don't really want to work as hard, but you, the employers recognize that if every, all the boomers leave at once, there's going to be a huge brain drain. So is there a way to, you know, to use their best skills in mentoring other employees, um, et cetera. And governments are looking at this and having incentives for um, employers to continue to retain all the workers. It makes sense to me. Are those the type of things that Georgetown works or is going to be working on? Yes, I mean, we're, we're looking, you know, we're looking at all of this and, you know, ac academia in terms of is a little bit of a different animal because um, we're just structured differently than the typical employer. And we've got, you know, actually the co-founder of the Aging Well Hub, um, Bill Novelli is 84 and he's, he's still, he's still, <laughs> he's still there. He decided to take a step down from teaching, but, um, you know, he is, he is active, he's working, continues to work on these issues, so. The living examples of people who are thriving uh, at ages that uh, are not, uh, we're accustomed to seeing, that in itself changes perspectives. Exactly, exactly. And I'm hoping that enough people will look at their parents and grandparents and say, you know, what are you talking about, you know? My mom is more active now than she was, you know, when she was in her 40s or 50s. Maybe at the point of going into an evolution in terms of uh, how the perception is of, uh, of older people. Right, exactly. And that's why I don't like the word retirement, um, because, you know, first of all, very few people are actually going to retire and do nothing. They're, you know, eat, they're going to either continuing to work in different capacity or or just do something different, reinvent themselves. And so terms like, you know, the third act, second half, all those are, are being used more and more. How's the housing market reacting to the aging boomers? You know, what we've seen in the housing market is we've seen a lot of people who, um, Boomers retiring, saying there is no way I'll ever go into retirement community, and um, and because they don't want to be segregated, they don't want to be there. So you know, looking at housing retirement, even traditional retirement communities, because I still think there's a very much place for the, the ex traditional retirement communities with the three levels of care, from independent to assisted living to nursing home. But I've seen changes where they are, I would call them inviting the public in rather than keeping the public out. So the retirement communities that will have a playground on, on the grounds of the retirement community. So their grandkids are not sitting there thinking, oh God, we don't want to visit grandma, but, but we can go and we can play. And just sitting around the playground and seeing little kids play, you know, makes just about anyone chuckle. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's a lot of that one that's being built in my neighborhood is looking at having a Starbucks, you know, that in within the communities to bring the public in. So there's just more that intergenerational, um, you know, type of interaction. There are also things called national, na naturally occurring retirement communities. So they're apartment buildings 
um, where they are, they have, you know, multi-generations living in them, but are specifically near Metro, and you can have caregivers come in and maybe have, you know, five clients in a day because they're all in the same place. And then universal design where houses are being built, where, you know, if you think about, you know, what your elderly relatives have and they have grab bars everywhere, but design has taken a huge leap where you've got all those, those helpful aids, but, um, but they're not a parent and they're being used for all generations and equally with people with disabilities to people who are fully able-bodied to older adults. Is there a recipe to aging well? Um, yes, and I would say, you know, there are several recipes. One of them is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the blue zones. Yes. Okay, so the blue zones, you know, are areas, as you know, around the world where in their pockets, it may be a particular town or a, a city or even a state um, where they have or a country where people live longer. And so um, Daniel Butner, who's written about the Blue Zones, went and studied those people and came back and said, it's, you know, it's a sense of um, purpose, you know, whether it's reason to get up in the morning is it tending a garden? Is it doing something more? Eating well, having a good diet, you know, sleep, having, enjoying life, having lots of friends around and, and active and, you know, to exercise, but none of it is necessarily go to the gym or do this. It's, it's just part of their lifestyle. And others have looked at this as well to look at and again, going back to stereotypes and, you know, looking at, is there some kind of code for, for, you know, healthy aging? And, um, and it really is a question of how you perceive yourselves. You know, do you think of yourself as, well, I'm old, I can't do anything, in which case we church shows you probably won't. But if you have, you know, and this is how and stereotypes work to internalize what a lot of people think as, as you know, um, the older adults and not having any value. At Georgetown, we did our no normal retirement map and we looked at six levers um, to aging well. And, you know, one is to have, um, you know, be financially secure in good health, connected communities, and that's everything from intergenerational interactions, family, friends, having a sense of purpose, having feel like you're adding value, continuing to add value, lifelong learning, you know, learn a new language, travel, do something to expand your horizons, and then finally, which is one of the keys, is resilience because something's always going to go wrong. The best laid plans, you will have made, you know, little hiccups, major events like a death, a health, you know, emergency that will throw all your great planning out. And it's your ability to take that, you know, and take it, you know, take those bumps in the road. And we found that as a result of the pandemic that older adults actually fared better um, in terms of it because you know they've lived a lifetime and for those you know that had access to have some of the interactions like you know we're just taking this in stride and and you know we'll do the best we can but they really had a healthy attitude and you can't help but not see some of the figures that are thrown around like uh, by uh, by 2035, people 65 and older will outnumber those under 18 for the first time. In, in California, uh, they say a quarter of the population will be 60 or older by 2031. I mean, those figures are, are somewhat daunting, aren't they? They are really daunting. And that, you know, that's really what goes to population aging. It's just not that more people are living longer, but there are more people living longer and there are more people living longer versus those that are coming up through the ranks 
So, um, so it puts, from a government perspective, it really is puts pressure on the economy. First of all, they are looking at now having to fund more people um, in terms of Social Security for a longer period of time. Health care costs go up. Long-term care costs are going up. There aren't the workers to pay for it. And from an economy standpoint, if they're looking at less people coming into the workforce, is GDP going to go down because there won't be as many workers, as much productivity? They're not going to be in the, uh, many people in the workforce. Their tax revenues are going to go down. It will directly affect their GDP. So for a lot of reasons, governments, and this isn't just the U.S., actually Japan is, you know, one of the, the, the country with the, you know, the highest longevity rate and greatest number of people. And, you know, they're really looking at this and instituting measures to say we need to address this head on. Now, someone I have interviewed before a couple of times, uh, her name is Lisa Sini, and she designs retirement homes. And if you can't answer it, it's okay. But but she hears people that they want a room to smoke their cannabis. Uh, does that surprise you? Actually, I hadn't heard that before. Um, but it doesn't surprise me. It, it doesn't surprise me for, and it depends, you know, why they're, they're smoking, whether it's just recreational, you know, which is fine. Um, or, you know, as people, again, as people age, it's, you know, the, it, this whole idea of palliative care and aging naturally, not trying to fix everything, but making yourselves more comfortable. And, you know, if you can do that through cannabis, rather than go buy a lot of expensive drugs, why not? And if you were king of retirement living, what would you do to improve retirement overall? Um, well, as I've said, you know, retire the word retire. Um, you know, nobody that I know of who is even thinking about retiring is talking about going to spend the day on the golf course every day. Um, but, but really what they're going to do, are they going to be starting a business? Are they going to you know, travel or are they going to just be doing a lot of more volunteer activities that they never had time to do when they were working full time? And also, where are they going to live? You know, how are, how are they going to continue to have that intergenerational engagement, which I think is critical to keeping people young and is also critical to, you know, the younger generation learning from the wise elders. And finally, uh, it's a question uh, for me to learn something from you. Uh, what role or what importance uh, is or what will social media have on, on this whole issue that we're talking about? I, you know, I, social media is such a powerful educator and um, standard setter. So, you know, I'd say have more people, you know, there's the, the grandmother who lifts weights, who has her own YouTube. And, um, you know, I think it can do so much to change perceptions and change the stereotypes. Jen, I sure appreciate it. Uh, the wealth of information. Thank you. Thank you very much. In today's Live Squared segment, we speak with Genfinity Precision Medicine founder, CEO, and Chief Science Officer, Dr. Jin Shi, who recently announced breaking news that hundreds of thousands of people who suffer from heart disease may have renewed hope for recovery. Now, on another matter there, I am still trying to get my head around all of this. I also know some of the most prestigious universities in the world are working on improving longevity and on aging, Greta and I, we talked about it. We really need to get on a bandwagon. Here's what's perfect, Andy, because you and I, before the show, were talking and you have peed me off. P.I. asterisk asterisk E.D. Because you are a perfect example of what's so frustrating to those of us in the longevity movement. So you work out, you live healthy, but what you said is you said, if I knew there was something that actually worked, I don't take anything because if I knew there was something that actually worked. So here's where I get peed off and here's where a researcher 
academician, professor, and clinician like Dr. Uh, Xi Jin gets frustrated. He's got something that works, and I'm going to let him tell you about it. So the frustration is that even an intelligent boomer like you, who wants to do all the right things, has that nagging doubt because there's so much l'huile de reptile, snake oil out there, that you've been burned. You've been, you've become jaded. Yeah. Okay. So Jin, do me a favor. Explain why somebody need not, we're going to talk about your products because he's an expert on NAD, measuring it, optimizing it. Let's address people's skepticism. Why, how can they trust that what you have and what you say does what it does, does it? Why? So I think you need, you don't need me. You don't need an expert to tell you whether something is working or is not working for you. You are the best judge uh, on your own health, your own body, and whether anything that you do, you eat or you drink, is doing any good or harm to your own body and your own health. So what you want to be careful is to first do no harm uh, to your body, and the next most important thing is to take actions that will optimize your health and prevent uh, age-related diseases to extend your health span or how long you are going to stay healthy. You can do it and obviously we can help you to do it better. I'm all for that, absolutely. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about what got you into this? I mean, what got your passion about this? Well, I have been in biomedical research for almost uh, 40 years. And, you know, I stayed in school for over 20 years. And then I stayed in school uh, as a professor uh, for, um, you know, over uh, 30 years. And my, my career um, and my passion have always been in what's usually called a healthcare. I actually don't call it healthcare anymore because it's actually a sick care uh, program that uh, we all have in, in almost every single country. So my recent passion is to change from the sick care uh, system to a truly healthcare system. When you speak of the healthcare system, you want to know uh, the risk factors for diseases before the clinical symptoms actually appear. So it's about prevention, it's about increasing your own wellness way, way before any potential problems can occur. And now what's different is we have the technology, we have the know-how uh, to find out what kind of uh, issues may predispose all of us to certain uh, diseases in the future. If, if we can identify these issues, which we do now, and we can take uh, concrete actions and the action can be multifactorial, and I usually call it holistic. You really have to take a holistic approach uh, to improve health, to reduce what I call sub-health or, or sub-optimal health issues um, for disease prevention and extension of health span. I'm speaking for you, Gene, and I'm probably out of line, but I know that once you saw the effectiveness and actually start even getting more reports on it, that that passion got, be, what's the word past passion, obsession, I'm going to call it an obsession, knowing that it does what it does. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the passion is uh, at least twofold. Number one, you know, I'm, 
I'm 60 years old. I'm actually a little over 60 now, um, by a few months. Um, you know, I worry about my own health, my own health span, and I wanted to do better. And, you know, we were fortunate to uh, find this uh, particular formulation that has really changed my own health for the better. And it, it, it's a dramatic improvement on many different aspects. And, you know, we can get into the details if you want, but um, so I wanted to help myself, my my family, and 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 also I want to help uh, everyone else, everyone that I know, uh, everyone and I don't know, because. You know, we can all do much better than we are doing now. And um, let me off this. Someone's, everyone's calling me on different the devices. <laughs> You're very, this, well, first of all, let me talk about why that is. NAD is at the forefront of the news right now. There's, I sent you a report, and Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the connection between heart health and heart disease prevention and NAD pretty conclusively correlated exciting stuff um so everybody suddenly is an expert on nad there's all different kinds of it gene i think what might be helpful is to talk a little bit about why your formula outperforms and you know that from studies and side-by-side -side comparisons through the t the assays the, the blood assays um why it's outperforming and why your phone is ringing off the hook and why you're constantly getting messages and ding dongs and ting tongs and and all that stuff yeah well so um there are many different ways that uh, we can potentially use to uh increase nad level at least people perceive uh, to have uh, multiple ways what we have found is number one uh a particular group of supplements that we call NAD precursors. NAD, NAD precursors are the building materials that our cells can use to make NAD in our cells. Okay, so these NAD precursors are the most efficient in elevating NAD levels in our body. So that, that's the first point. And the second point is, um, if you just give the NAD precursors a norm, uh, they do not work as efficiently as when you mix several different supplements in the right proportion and the right uh, type of supplements together into one formulation. So Your we secret cocktail. Your secret yeah, cocktail. You make, yeah, you, yeah. well, uh, the, the product now is, is a powder. You use the powder to make a cocktail. And yeah, you can call it cocktail uh, after you, you know, add some water. Um, so we, 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 we uh, were fortunate to uh, have discovered, actually my wife did it. Uh, I don't want to take credit away from her. And she um, she was able to come up with four ingredients and that work together synergistically. So when we put these four ingredients into one formulation, that not only makes our cells uh, uh, produce more NAD, but also revitalize our cells. And this is really the magic that we were not expecting. And you know, that's how, how science and how discoveries are usually made. You are looking for something, but you discover something that can, can be completely different. That's the beauty of science and discovery. And you know, we, we were very fortunate um, to have found this, uh, this formula. And we are happy for war our customers, our friends who are working with us. So let me ask you this, and it goes back to what Greta was saying originally about me is, uh, if you take, this is strictly for preventative purposes, right? I mean, for example, if I take the cocktail, 
I'm not going to know whether I'm any different or not. So as opposed to, you know, when you eat well, you, you feel good, you ate something well, you exercise real hard, you feel your body feels well. But is this more or less is just is preventative? Is that right? Not exactly. You are partially right. It's both preventive and I can use the word curative. And I mean, I don't use this word very easily because the cure is a pretty uh, <laughs> a big, big deal. But in the case of uh, NAD supplementation, or I prefer to call, call it NAD optimization, okay, you really want to have the right amount of NAD in your body. Too much is not good, too little is not good. You want to be in the right range. And we, you know, we can go into the details if you want. But so, um, we, as we age, our NAD levels decline and it's reduced to the unhealthy level. And in many people, it dip below uh, certain threshold that's actually dangerous uh, for, uh, for not only the health and sometimes could be uh, cause major, major diseases, including you know, heart failure. So you can use NAD supplementation as a preventive strategy when you are still healthy and you don't have any issues. But for most people in our age group, and we will have certain conditions that are not perfect. They are not function, functioning at the optimum level. And we can use this supplement to actually treat these conditions. I can give you, I can give you uh, examples on, on myself. So uh, about, you know, from 20 years ago to uh, about two years ago, and also, I was having major problems with my back, my uh, knee, I had asthma, and I, um, I had you know, muscle and joint pains because I'm a tennis player, I was having major, major issues. Three months after, the, uh, after taking the supplements, all these issues are gone. You know, I don't take uh, asthma medicine anymore, you know, for over a year. My, I don't have a knee problem anymore. My, my back, my back pain is gone. I mean, this, you, you, this are really, uh, for, you know, treatment purposes, not, not really pre preventive, but, you know, we, we can still, the supplement is st potentially still help me to prevent major diseases that are not uh, here yet, but may appear years in the future. So you want to you want to reduce or eliminate suboptimal health issues now, and uh, to prevent the future diseases. And you can also use it to treat certain um, problems that you are having now. We have all kinds of report, you know, better mental clarity and uh, improvement on heart problems, you know, more energy, that's almost from, you know, e everyone, better sleep and even better sexual performance. All right. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm the living example. <laughs> so, um, he says that because he has amazing. a very young child. He's not talking about a bunch of girlfriends. He's got a very <laughs> okay. young child. He's not a playboy. But, well, but, but, but hang on, because Andy, you said another thing, and this really got uh, my interest. He got it really peed, huh? peed off. When, when we, yeah, early. No, this wasn't peed off. Oh. You were saying, you know, hey, like, okay, it was like, duh. You were saying animals. You get, yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little story, the personal story about my fi nearly 15 year old poodle Romeo. And I'm going to take, when I take my poodle to the vet, the vet who between you, me and the lamppost, the last, one of the last times I went had the guy on hand in case we needed to put, I mean, I don't even want to say this. Oh. He had the guy there, the guy, oh, she, you know, no. 
that was a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. I had video of Romeo running around. Dr. Gene had said, I said, what about giving NED to my poodle? He goes, oh, give it to him. He'll be yeah. running around like a puppy. I'm like, yeah, right. I have video of Romeo running around. He's putting on weight. He's eating food. Bless you, Romeo. I love you. He's taking a nap right now. But so the point is, yeah, this stuff extrapolates over in, in some cases, not all, to great um, options for better pet health. So you were right on the money. I yeah. wasn't mad at you about that. I we was happy that you re mm -hmm. recognized that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the thing that occurred to me, I mean, as you get older, one of the things that I do know is your um, uh, blood pressure goes up, cholesterol goes up, things like that, generally speaking, and I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but uh, uh, I wonder if something like this, taking it over a longer term, uh, like NED, uh, might eliminate some of those problems. Uh, it sounds, what do you think? Well, for, for, for cholesterol level, um, unfortunately, NED is probably not going to help uh, much. Um, for blood pressure, I, I have a couple of people uh, telling me that uh, their blood pressure becomes better. Uh, but we don't have enough data to know whether it's actually going to help or not. And Dr. Shi is a data nut. Know this, that yeah. anything he says has, I mean, his idea of fun is crunching numbers and data. My head's in a, my head's in a knot just thinking about it. So uh -huh. he's, a, he's a data freak. That's his thing. So it's all with him. It's all about the proof, the evidence, the data, the blah, blah, blah. There's no blue smoke and mirrors here. It's all very much science based. Yeah. So where do we, uh, where do we get hold of this stuff? Well, you, you can uh, visit our uh, website. Uh -huh. Uh, it's Jinfinity.com. J I N. Uh, we'll I put it up. Uh, N I I I T I. Yeah. It sounds fantastic. So, uh, what do you do? What do you have to do now to get this into the mainstream? Well, we uh, we are going to focus on education. That's what the company is going to do. I mean, we. We have a, a great test, we have a great product, and we know we can help millions and millions of people. And unfortunately, a, only a very small fraction of the population knows of NAD, and, and a few uh, have tried. Once they try the product, and they, uh, they know the, it makes a difference and they are going to stay on the on the product they are going to get the benefits and you know i'm i'm, I'm a scientist i don't know uh anything about uh, you know marketing or sales i don't care and what i know uh what to do is you know develop the product and now you know i've been a professor for 40 years so i know a little bit about education um, and we're, we're going to try to educate uh, not only the public and we need to start educating the doctors. You know, doctors should know about NAD because they learned in, in, in college and at least in, in medical schools um, but 99% of them have forgotten about uh, NAD. Okay, that's I, I see that easily because I forgot about the NAD as well until about three years ago. Um, so we are going to have to educate the medical professionals and the public and we are going to try to give them the necessary information and let them you know, decide whether it's something that's going to help them. Oh, by the way, this is a good time of day where I am right now. It's heading, getting close-ish to like that five o'clock when everybody would have a cocktail or think about it or whatever. It's a great time of day to take a little NAD to get a little pick-me-up. So I wish you had some there, Andy. We, you could take it and uh, yeah. talk to you in a couple hours and see how you're feeling. 
this is uh, well dr she thank you uh I, I really really appreciate your time today it's my pleasure Next week, we talk with a northern Idaho farmer who grows an ancient organic grain with amazing health benefits. Meantime, I think Mimi is finishing up one of her delicious creations in the kitchen. I'm back. So the farro is cooked and I drained it from all the water. I'm just gonna assemble everything so we go with farro in first or second or whatever you like then cannellini beans so you can i cook my cannellini beans from scratch but you can use the organic uh canned cannellini it's fine they are good so chopped celery very fine Cut them like that. And uh, some pickled onions. Of course, I pickle the, my onions at home with some uh, vinegar. See how beautiful it is. Get my tuna. I had my tuna with olive oil always put the tuna in olive oil with this salad you add it all right oh so good then you add your chopped capers you 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 know rinse them drain them chop them and i chop them with chop them with some uh peppercorn so it's gonna give a little spiciness to this dish. Then a zest of a whole lemon that I zested already. You put it up. Alrighty. You put your vinegar, you add your vinaigrette. So the vinaigrette is olive oil, lemon, juice of lemon, and uh, red wine vinegar, salt and pepper, and one clove of garlic. All right, so you season this with it, and then you add some arugula, or if you like uh, radicchio, you can add radicchio. I like arugula and radicchio, so today I have arugula, so that's what I'm putting. Some chopped parsley, and we move this around oh my goodness so cute and so good already so taste for the salt and pepper and if it's not seasoned enough you just add some as you go so let me just taste a little bit <laughs> i don't know where my thing is oh here we go Voila. Let's do this. Mount it. Like that. Mm -hmm. Let me taste it. I had a little, little, uh, voila. Mm, you took it from me. Okay. Mm, it's good, but I can add a little bit more salt. And a little bit. No pepper. Voila. And bon appetit. This is very, very healthy. You can make it in 12 minutes. So enjoy. Until next time. Thanks, Mimi. We will see you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. And if you enjoyed this episode or you learned something new, I want to tell you three ways so you can support the show and keep Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared going. And number one, get yourself subscribed. Every week, I am bringing on the influencers and the people who can teach you something or have something interesting to share. 
So take a moment to hit that subscribe button. And number two, this is the ultimate way to support Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared, and it takes less than a minute. You can write something short and sweet like, I love this show, it has changed your life, or something you learned from it. You know, I am not exaggerating that I read reviews every day and every single one, whether short or long, it does mean everything to me. The more reviews means the higher we rank on all those algorithms, which means bigger guests. So take a minute to leave a review. And then three, share the show with your friends and just hit that share button. I'm eternally grateful. Thank you so much for supporting this show. I will see you again next Tuesday for another episode of Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared.